Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here at the launch of the NYU Wild Animal Welfare Program. This is really exciting. Thanks so much. My name is Jeff Sebo. I am a co-director of the program, joined here by my colleague, Becca Franks, the, my fellow co-director of the program and several of our colleagues uh, whom we will introduce in a minute. But we first wanna set the stage by talking a little bit about this topic, why this topic matters to us and this program, what the program will do, and then the event, and we can introduce our fellow panelists and have a wide ranging conversation about wild animal welfare, what it matters, what we need to do and how we can start doing it. And yeah, feel free to come take your seats and welcome to all the online guests too, by the way, thank you for being here. So as many of us know, there are many animals in the world, very many of them, the vast majority of them are wild animals and increasingly human activity is impacting wild animals, both directly and indirectly at unimaginable scales, agriculture, deforestation, the wildlife trade. These activities are harming and killing trillions of wild animals per year and contributing to global threats that are impacting many more wild animals per year. And so this is uh, an issue that affects wild animals at a vast scale, trillions and trillions of wild animals are uh, vulnerable to human activity. And this topic is also neglected. To the degree that we focus on animals in the environment at all, wild animals often slip through the cracks. Animal advocates often focus more on captive and domesticated animals than on free and wild animals. Environmental advocates often focus more on species and ecosystems than on individual animals and their interests and needs. And this issue is potentially tractable. We are impacting lots of wild animals and we might not know much yet about how we can improve our impacts on them. And we might not have much capacity yet for improving our impacts on them. And we might not even frankly have the political will yet to act on the knowledge with the capacity that we have, but we do have the power to improve in these ways. We can build knowledge, we can build power, we can build political will towards helping wild animals. And so the NYU Wild Animal Welfare Program, which now as of this moment exists, <laughs> will contribute to advancing our understanding about what wild animals are like, how humans and wild animals interact, and how humans can improve our interactions with wild animals at scale. This will, at least in its initial phase, primarily be a research and outreach program. We will conduct and support high quality, scholarly, multidisciplinary research about these questions. And we'll also engage in outreach by doing public events like this one, as well as various other ones, by supporting our colleagues at other institutions, by collaborating with our colleagues, at other institutions so that we can contribute to building a robust field of wild animal welfare that can stand alongside with and overlap with other fields that will also be in the conversation today like conservation biology and compassionate conservation and so on and so forth. And on that note, I want to note that in this room right now are a lot of colleagues both from this institution and from other institutions. We have lots of people here from NYU. We have people here from Harvard and Yale and Lewis and Clark and Vermont and Wesleyan and many, many other institutions. We also have our colleagues here from the Wild Animal Initiative here in the front row, a nonprofit organization that has been advancing uh, issues related to wild animals for years now. So there are a lot of people here who can collaborate with us on this topic, and we are very, very happy about that. In a moment, my colleague Becca will introduce the event and introduce the panel and everybody will say a little bit about what brought them into the topic. So I can close my introduction by saying a little bit about what brought me into the topic. I care about wild animals and wild animal welfare in very large part for the reasons that I noted a moment ago. This is a vast issue affecting a vast and diverse population of sentient beings. This is a neglected issue that often slips through the cracks. And this is a potentially tractable issue that if we do work to build knowledge and power and political will, we can address more than we are right now. Uh, and I came into it more specifically when I was researching a book that I wrote and released this year on how animals 
matter for pandemics and climate change and other global threats because I was working on this book and uh, of course I appreciated that industries like factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade contribute to pandemics and climate change and other global threats. But what I increasingly started to realize is that pandemics and climate change and other global threats also affect animals, including wild animals, directly and indirectly. They can make animals sick. They can make animals suffer and die in fires and floods. They can also impact animals indirectly by affecting weather systems and other environmental systems. And that really made me appreciate how much wild animals matter, not only because they are sentient and have lives that matter to them, but also because human activity is directly and indirectly impacting them more and more. And so my research on that book brought me into this topic more uh, from a scholarly perspective. And I can also just briefly note that there have also, as is the case with I think many of us, been personal interactions with wild animals over the years that have reminded me that they are individuals who matter in addition to being parts of species and ecosystems. Feral cats at uh, the college that I attended and I formed personal relationships with some of them. When I taught at UNC Chapel Hill, there was a family of squirrels who built a nest under the air conditioner outside of my office. And so for two years, I got to watch them have kids and play with their kids and hang out as a family. And that was a reminder. They also broke into my office once and I had to create a funnel of couches through the hallways to get them back out. But that was uh, wonderful. And then walking my dog around New York City, I see through his reaction to all of the wild animals in the city, uh, how, how many there are and how he develops personal relationships of various kinds with, with each of them. Uh, and so those, those have been useful reminders in a society that often frames wild animals as mere parts of species and ecosystems, useful reminders that they are individuals with lives that matter to them too. And with that, I'll thank everybody for being here and turn it over to my colleague, Becca, who can uh, continue the introduction. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. It's so great to see this wonderful crowd here and welcome to all of our online guests as well. And thank you, Jeff, for setting that up so beautifully for us. Um, so I'm here to introduce uh, the panel today and the program for today, the event. Um, and I'd like to start by also thanking our co-sponsors, NYU Environmental Studies and NYU Animal Studies for um, helping us set up and run this event uh, and making this event possible. Um, we're going to have uh, short uh, answers and Q&A with our panelists, about two minutes each uh, per, per cycle. We'll go through these questions up at the top here. And then at the end of the program, we're gonna have an audience discussion. Um, so we'll have the opportunity for the uh, in-person guests. We'll have a mic and we'll pass it around and you'll have a chance to ask questions of the panelists. And online, there should be a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom interface of the webinar that you can enter your questions into the Q&A. And the advantage of doing that online, which is a nice little feature, um, is that you can also look at other people's questions as the panel progresses and upvote the ones that you'd like to hear answered and, and add your own as well. Um, so, uh, with that, all, all, we heard a little bit about Jeff's uh, origin story about how he ended up here today. So I'll, I'll give you mine uh, before we move on to our esteemed affiliates. Um, so I've had an ongoing fascination with aquatic life in general, um, and I felt drawn uh, to, to study and understand uh, aquatic animals and aquatic life in general. Um, and so this has really um, moved me forward and in particular understanding um, what they're like uh, what their motivations are, what their preferences are, what their lives consist of, and of course, their well-being as well. And we know that aquatic life faces a huge number of threats from industrialized fishing to polluted waters to uh, climate change to ocean acidif acidification, damming, all of these threats. Um, but you know what really sort of brought the complexity of the issue uh, to the front for me was working with a colleague, uh, another professor at NYU uh, Environmental Studies and uh, one of our affiliates with the Wild Animal Welfare Program, Jennifer Jacquet. So we were working on a project about aquaculture 
which is the farming of aquatic life. Um, and in that project, we are sort of demonstrating the scale that it has reached. So currently aquatic uh, aquaculture uh, consists of farming a comparable number of individuals as there is in all of terrestrial animal combined, terrestrial animal farming combined. So if you add up all of the individual animals in terrestrial animal farming, that is now matched by the number of individuals that aquatic animals that are being farmed globally. And that scale is also matched now to the number of aquatic animals uh, that we're harvesting and, and hunting from the oceans and rivers. So the scale is immense and it's growing. It's continuing to grow and it's being propelled along by governments, by industry, by um, uh, 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 research institutions, unfortunately, as well. And, and so there's a lot of different arguments that have been made about why aquaculture can and should grow. Um, and there's, you know, they're incredibly alarming, the arguments that are, are, are being made. Um, but the one that's particularly relevant to us today is that somehow aquaculture, the farming of aquatic animals, will alleviate some of the pressures on the wild animals. And so looking into this issue, reading about it more, um, I've come to learn and understand that number one, that is not true. Uh, the research shows that when you start farming an aquatic species, you just add more animals to the pool of animals that are being uh, used in this way. It doesn't act as a replacement model. So that is a false uh, line of argument. Um, but worse still, is that a lot of the animals who are being farmed in aquaculture are being fed live, uh, you know, caught wild animals. Uh, a lot of these animals are carnivores, and so they are not being fed, uh, you know, uh, vegetable or any kind of like non-meat products. They're being fed other animals, and primarily those other animals are wild animals. So not only is it acting as is it not acting as a replacement model, it's also increasing the pressures on wild animals. And then thirdly, the animals themselves are wild. So in terrestrial animal agriculture, we're talking mostly about domesticated species and just a, a handful of them, around 20 at most. In aquaculture, there's over 400 distinct species that are being farmed. And they're almost entirely all wild, non-domesticated. So this is a huge pressure on wild animals that are being kept in these intensive conditions. And so this really brings to my mind how complicated and um, you know, like intricate the, the pressures are, the issues are, and how we really have to look across so many different areas and so many different fields um, because the harms are sort of accumulating and coming even from unexpected places when we're talking about wild animal welfare. So that's a little bit about like how I got here. Jeff came to me with the opportunity to co-direct this program. So of course I jumped on it right away and was just thrilled to have the chance to work with Jeff and then bring on board this uh, incredible group of distinguished affiliates. And uh, three of them are here with us today and we're delighted to have them here. So I'll briefly introduce them before um, giving them a chance to tell us more about their own research and what brought them to wild animal welfare and trust. So um, closest to me, we have Colin Jeromack. He's professor of sociology and environmental studies at NYU and our departmental chair here at NYU Environmental Studies. His research examines uh, how relationships with animals and nature shape social life in the city. He is the author of many articles on uh, sociology, animals, and the environment, and the books Up to Heaven and Down to Hell, Fracking, Freedom, and Community in an American Town, and the global pigeon. Next, we have Christine Webb, who is a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University's Department of Human and uh, Evolutionary Biology, a broadly trained primatologist with expertise in social behavior, motivation, and emotion. Her recent work centers on consolation and empathy and our close primate cousins across several sanctuary and wild settings. She's also uh, like, uh, giving a course uh, at, uh, for our undergraduates this year um, that is over-enrolled. So um, lucky few got in. 
Um, and last but not least, we have Dale Jamison, Professor Emeritus of Environmental Studies and Director of the Center for Environmental and Animal Protection at NYU. He's published more than 100 articles and chapters, including Reason in a Dark Time, Why the Struggle to Stop Climate Change Failed, and What It Means for Our Future. He's also uh, author of Ethics in the Environment, an Introduction, and finally, Morality's Progress, Essays on Humans, Other Animals, and the Rest of Nature. So please join me in welcoming our panel, and um, then <laughs> I'll sit down and we'll, we'll pass on the questions to them. By the way, if you have an open seat next to you, can you raise your hand so that some of the people sitting on the floor can uh, uh, consider sitting in a chair instead? Good one. Awesome. Yeah, great. Did you want to get something? Sure. OK, so I'd like to invite uh, you to share what brought you to be interested in wild animal welfare through research and or personal life. Um, and I guess we'll start with Colin here. Sure. Uh, I'll, the, the person I'll just say in one line, I've been vegan for over 20 years and vegan for animal rights reasons. And so, uh, so, so my, my concern for wild animals is my concern for any animal as an individual, as a sentient being um, who has a right to life. Um, I, I, how I approach it from a scholarly perspective is, as, as was alluded to, my first book was about pigeons. And... Um, I didn't really mean for it to be about pigeons. I was, I was a, I'm a sociologist by training and I was interested, I still am in urban life, but um, I, became, I became really focused on the ways that uh, not only pigeons, but other animals were really just, there really is this notion that there really isn't room in the city for them on um, the extermination campaigns against pigeons and other non-human animals as not only sort of not having a place, but as, you know, as, as being, as, as sort of uh, this idea that there's a war against non-native species against animals that are in places that we've decided are only for people, sidewalks, ledges, what have you. And, uh, you know, as a sociologist, I really thought that, like, I don't really think this can all be explained or defended by epidemiology, by disease threat, by uh, displacing native species. Some of it, sure. You know, and I started to talk to some, some, some wildlife experts and epidemiologists about pigeons in particular, because the city was in the midst of this campaign to um, exterminate them. There was there and uh, you know criminalize feeding pigeons, and ecologists would say they don't really displace other species. They don't really care about. They're not native, but they don't really bother um, other species. And then you know I would hear about bird flu and West Nile virus and all these other things. And uh, I, I I talked to a bunch of epidemiologists like we don't really give a shit about pigeons. They they don't they they are they are they're highly resistant to the to the to West Nile virus. Um, if they get the bird flu, they die quickly, so they're not really good at transmitting it. And we don't really have evidence that anybody's ever really gotten sick from casual interactions with a street pigeon. And so um, this got me really interested more broadly, interested in, and um, not just interested scholarly, but about you know how it is that 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 non-human animals, particularly non-native ones, but even native ones that are common that are living in cities, uh, partly by virtue of us not really seeing them as real wild animals. Uh, and and really just you know where that comes from, where that animosity comes from, and how it, and how more broadly how that kind of um, disdain for these non-human animals not only affects them but affects the way we think about what other species are deserving and the places and where animals are allowed to be and where they're not. I mean, look at right now uh, the killing of lanternflies. It can even you can defend ecologically that they're a problem. The way that my the schools are trying to educate my eight-year-old to celebrate stomping and smashing and killing as many of these as possible to make a sport out of it, to make a game out of it. I think there are larger ways that that, uh, you know, can make people view all kinds of species as disposable and killing them not only as acceptable, but perhaps even enjoyable and something, you know, as if, as if it's killing these non-human animals the same as recycling, you're doing your good for uh, the city. So this is actually what got me into, into these issues. Uh, you know, these, these non-human animals that I like to call pedestrian animals because they're literally, they're common and they literally walk on the sidewalks and occupy many of these places, spaces in cities, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Christine Webb and as Becca mentioned, much of my past work has focused on the social behavior of our closest primate relatives, um, most recently with wild chakma baboons and sanctuary bonobos and chimpanzees. And 
I'm especially interested in how um, these and other animals establish and maintain complex social relationships and the social emotions that uh, facilitate that process, such as empathy. And I guess um, when it comes to wild animal welfare, I'm especially interested in this social dimension. So we know that for many animals, social relationships are paramount uh, to health and well being. And we also know um, there's some recent work in chimpanzees showing that human impact erodes not only biological diversity, but behavioral diversity as well. So opportunities for um, these chimpanzees to socialize, to learn socially from others, uh, to maintain their rich sociocultural traditions. And so I guess I'm really interested in how um, we can make sure that wild animal welfare incorporates this important social dimension. So we make sure that individuals, um, not only biological needs are met, but also their social needs. And I guess more broadly um, and more recently, I feel like most, if not all of my teaching and writing focuses on human exceptionalism, uh, particularly as it often gets perpetuated under the pretense of good, hard, cold science. Um, and that can kind of come in the form of how scientists uh, treat other species in practice, but also how we conceptualize them and their minds and uh, their interests and their emotions. And of course, how those kind of concepts can then further enable um, and normalize the kind of practical uh, ways, the mistreatment of other species in science uh, and society more broadly. Thank you so much. So um, this is, I think I, asked, I think I should be told. So, so I grew up in Southern California where there are a lot of wild animals and uh, a lot of them are human, um, <laughs> but you know, a lot of them aren't human. And some of them are what have come to be called liminal animals, you know, like coyotes and so on. And I think I was, always impressed actually at a very early age how you know wildness is kind of a continuum or something that there's always wildness there I think maybe I got that because you know we had a whole a whole run of dogs when I was growing up we never succeeded really in training any of them you know even the ones who got house trained still somehow managed to do their own thing you know um, so um, so and, and by the way, there's a wonderful essay by the poet Gary Snyder called The Practice of the Wild, which is on exactly this, this topic, on the sort of universality of wildness, really, among, among all, all living things. So the distinction between the wild and the domestic has always seemed to me to be kind of, like many of our distinctions, a kind of con convenient mm -hmm. uh, notional distinction, but not one that really cuts very deep. And I think in my own work, then, uh, that started to become apparent when I got interested in zoos. I mean, I grew up in San Diego. Um, you know, we didn't do a lot of things as a family, but what we did do is go to the zoo. We always had a family membership to the San Diego Zoo. And, um, and, and on the one hand, it was always kind of the high point of my week when we would go to the zoo. These were my favorite kinds of wild animals in San Diego. Um, but on the other hand, there was also something that was kind of profoundly depressing about, about the zoo. And so in the mid 80s, I wrote an essay called Against Zoos, in which I basically laid out arguments against keeping these animals in captivity. And while I continue to think that, that the arguments in that paper are sound, it, in, in the background, it sort of does presuppose that there is some important distinction between human managed spaces and spaces that are sort of beyond human management and effect. And one thing that's become increasingly clear in the almost four decades since I wrote that essay is that that distinction, at least as a categorical distinction, is no longer a viable distinction. That there is really no part of the planet, terrestrial or marine, which is beyond the effects of human patterns of production and consumption. 
And I think it's really that fact that is the sort of objective correlate uh, of my subjective experience of not really being able to see the profound distinction between wild animals and other animals that has really brought all of us to this moment now as seeing that we really, in, in some sense, all share this planet and this crazy circus of causal interactions be, between each other. And we can no longer really retreat behind the idea that these are other nations with their own ways of life that we don't affect and really have nothing much to do with us. Um, I think the last thing I'll say, because it's a bit of a marker maybe for things that we'll say later uh, today, but certainly something I think that we'll talk about in the project, is especially if you think a lot about zoo animals and you get into arguments with many well-meaning people who work in zoos, it does make you recognize how complex the notion of welfare is, uh, especially with creatures you don't understand very well, who are now living under conditions that they did not evolve to live in. And I think any project that's devoted to thinking about wild animal welfare is going to have to think very, very seriously about what welfare means in that context. Great, thank you all for introducing yourselves. And just to note how things will proceed from here, we have a couple of questions that we wanna to pose to uh, the panel, and then we can get short one or two minute answers as a way of stimulating conversation. And then we want as fast as possible to move to a broader discussion. So as a reminder, we will welcome questions from people in the room with us, as well as from people online. People online can be entering questions and comments into the Q&A tab on Zoom, and then we can alternate between in-person and audience questions and comments uh, a little bit later in the discussion. But for now, we can prime that with, uh, with a few questions that we can pose to everybody. And so I can start by presenting a question to Christine, and then we can go around the panel. What is it about this moment that makes wild animal welfare a worthy topic to be discussing. There are so many topics, obviously, that we should be paying attention to right now. Why should wild animal welfare be among those topics? Yeah, I mean, I think there are manifold reasons. One that I can highlight um, based on my own experience in my own field has to do with recent developments um, in technology that uh, generate new ethical questions when it comes to how uh, we research and study other animals. So some of you might be aware of this new technology. There's these things called animal attached devices, um, collars, accelerometers, um, drones, you know, even things like gene editing. And while uh, some of these technologies do seem to kind of alleviate previous ethical concerns. So for instance, maybe um, you don't have to kind of go in situ into the field and, and follow a troop of monkeys on foot, but you can kind of collect data from them remotely through these um, aerial devices like drones. Even though they might sort of resolve some ethical concerns, they raise new ones uh, that have barely been addressed. So in the context of say, a technology like camera traps, right? Um, how are we using these data? Um, what kind of consent is or is not involved. And so there's a lot of ethical questions um, that technologies used in science and conservation and, and beyond raise when it comes to wild animal welfare that I think haven't been kind of fully addressed um, and you know that warrant our attention. Great, thank you. Dale? Yeah, I think uh, part of what makes this issue so, so salient um, at this moment goes back to what I was, I was saying about the ubiquity of human and unavoidable nature of human interactions with the non-human world. Um, for those of you who have been corrupted by philosophy, you, you, you will know that the 19th century philosopher Henry Sidgwick was sort of on the leading edge of philosophers who thought that we had global ethical obligations. But when Sidgwick was sitting in the senior common room in his Cambridge college, reading a three week old newspaper about famine in India, there was very little by way of action that could be taken to prevent the deaths that were then occurring. We're not living in that world anymore. We're living in a world in which our effects uh, in remote parts of the world and on various forms of life are immediate and instantaneous. 
And I think that makes a whole range of ethical questions no longer avoidable. And I think this is one salient one. Sure, I'm gonna, if I can, I'm gonna tweak the question a little bit because uh, I don't claim to be that much of an expert on why, you know, on, on the whole breadth of wild animals, which is possibly the biggest category of non-human animals that there are. But I, I do think that this question of like, for me of like, why, urban wildlife now or urban non-human animals. I mean, of course, first of all, we more people now live in cities than, than don't. And, um, and it, this is too simplistic, but I always, I always think that like, you know, animals face, this, animals face this increasingly dire fork in the road where they're either going to not be able to make it in our climate change future, or they're going to make it in very different ways than they did before, usually meaning adapting to and living with and among people. And so I see these pedestrian animals that I that I talked about as like, you know, the ones that have already been doing it for a long time as really just on the on the cutting edge of you all. I mean, you mentioned coyotes. So now coyotes are have taken up residence in New York City. That's new in the past 15 years, right? And they used to rarely even traipse in, but now they're here permanently. And so um in a, in a climate change urbanized world, more and more non-human animals that are going to make it are going to be living in cities. And I really don't think we've caught up with that yet as far as the, you know, the way that in every, people's everyday life, their future, they may not be able to rely on the past as a way to guide them and how they can live their life, the resources they can use, what have you. Uh, we, we can't really rely on the past to tell us how we're gonna form ethical relationships with these non-human animals. Um, and so I just think that, you know, there's even talk of as some animals get crowded out of their native habitats, perhaps cities can even be sanctuaries where you will move certain non-human animals to, to live in urban parks. And so um, I just think that, that this, that, that this, uh, this you know, not, wild, wild animals as pedestrians living in cities with us is we've reached a moment where that's, that's a conversation that really needs to be front and center in my mind. Good, thank you. Becca. Um, yeah, that's, this is all fantastic. I mean, it's all horrible and, and, and terrifying, but <laughs> completely agree with all of these points. And I would just sort of summarize my perspective, which is that we're finding ourselves in this moment in history where our relationship with, uh, you know, all of the other beings and entities on this planet is radically changed. Um, and to the extent where our role is sort of uh, taking up too much space and uh, that's not only becoming a problem for everyone else on this planet, but also for our own very existence. Uh, so with the biodiversity crash that we're facing and the loss of all of these species, um, at some point, uh, we won't be able to survive. Uh, humanity is not capable of surviving without a solid base of biodiversity. So we need to start seeing the inherent value um, and the limits that are required on our um, you, you know, extraction and exploitation, and try to get ourselves to steer that relationship into being something more uh, mutually beneficial and re uh, reciprocal. And that's something, as Colin's pointing out, uh, you know, is is we can't look to the past uh, necessarily in a lot of cases. Um, this is something that's new that we have to figure out for going forward. Oh, yeah, I can I can share my answer briefly as well, which is well a two part answer. The first part being that. Wild animals and wild animal welfare have always mattered, but we have neglected that fact for a long time and, you know, better late than never, I suppose. But the, the second part of the answer is, as everybody else has noted, this is an important time in history because we are starting to recognize the effects of human activity on wild animals, not only at the species and ecosystem level, but also at the individual wild animal welfare level. We have seen over the past several years fires and floods and other events that will be more frequent and intense in a world reshaped by human-caused climate change affecting wild animals by the billions. The 2020 Australia bushfires harmed or killed an estimated 3 billion wild animals we know about, right? More recently, there have been fires and floods in the Pacific Northwest that have killed hundreds of thousands of captive and wild animals alike. There have been heat waves in the United States that have killed cattle and killed wild animals, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that has increased the salience of this issue, and people are caring about this issue more than we have in the past. And that is good, but we do need to build on that. That is not enough yet. And we really do need to learn more, and we need to build more capacity. And we need to do it fast, and this is a moment where we can 
and where it can really make a difference because we are imagining big structural transformative changes right now because we recognize that we need to make our own societies more resilient and sustainable to prepare for climate change. And when we do that, when we change our cities to be more energy efficient, we can ask, should we also change them to be more accommodating of non-human residents too? There can be a moment where we are contemplating bigger changes than we sometimes contemplate. And if we can include wild animals in those conversations, then we can make changes in positive, some mutually beneficial ways. Great, thank you. Um, so for our next question, we'd like to consider how wild animal welfare is distinct from other fields that are closely related um, and how those other fields address questions that are similar to wild animal welfare, but also have uh, either ignored some of those questions and what is sort of the added value of animal welfare in comparison to these other fields. Um, so, and we'll start with Dale for this one. Oh, I don't <laughs> actually think I have an answer to, uh, to that question. Um, and, and so following the inspirational uh, example of Colin, I will answer the question I would have asked myself that's closest related to that. Um, so, so really for me, all of these questions about animals and nature really come down to one fundamental question that I'm interested in. And that question is, what should I do? Where the I isn't just me personally, it is me personally, but it's also the communities that I'm part of, the institutions that organize my society, the communities in which I have, I have causal reach. Now, I'm not interested in what's the best possible world. I'm not interested in what is the world that God would have created had he consulted me. What I'm interested in is what I and, and communities and collective agents that I'm part of can actually do to make a difference in this world. And that brings us to two other research questions that perhaps distinguish this field a little from other fields, but not by much. A second has to do with conceptions of responsibility. In a world in which everything is interconnected, what, what are the limits of my responsibility? Because if there are no limits, I mean, to be responsible for everything is in a way to be responsible for nothing. So how do I understand responsibility now in this interconnected world? And that then relates uh, to a third question, which is how do I understand these incredibly complex causal relations that exist between things that happen over here that can be rather trivial and things that happen over there that can have really profound effects. Now, one thing we know about this world that I think we need to take very seriously is that well-meaning actions can often have devastatingly paradoxical effects. So, for example, I don't mean to tar all NGO actions in crisis situations with this, with this brush, but there are examples where the major effect of Western NGO aid in a devastating situation is to drive up the price of housing and create more homeless people in the affected communities. Those are the kind of paradoxical consequences that with which we have to be concerned. And so I will just kind of end my response by echoing Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Ronald Reagan once said that the most chilling words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. I, I think one of the things we should be concerned about in this area is that for many animals in the world, the most chilling words might be, I'm from Homo sapiens and I'm here to help you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll just go down the line. Yeah, Kristen. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, again, kind of coming back to my own field and experience, um, I think wild animal welfare is distinct from a field like ethology or primatology or animal behavior insofar as it really uh, privileges and prioritizes the subjective experiences of other species. Um, 
I think, you know, there can still kind of be a tendency uh, for scientists and in my field included to kind of doubt or downplay the existence of animal mental lives or to kind of assume that we can never really know what they experience. Um, but animal welfare as a field was sort of born out of the conviction that there are many kind of indirect ways of, of learning about um, how animals feel and experience the world, just as there are many indirect ways of learning about how fellow humans um, feel, uh, including through language. Um, but that there are many kind of other ways outside of, of kind of verbal reports that we can learn about and that we use all the time with, with humans that we can sort of apply to other species to learn about their, their conscious lives. And then as Jeff alluded to in his introduction, um, clearly the kind of traditional focus on in fields like conservation um, and conservation biology has been more at the, the species or population level, um, the level of ecosystem integrity, whereas animal welfare as a field prioritizes and privileges um, the individual. And um, compassionate conservation, which is a closely aligned field, um, as some of you may know, kind of works to like um, minimize situations in which conservation um, and animal welfare are in conflict. But while animal welfare is kind of a broader um, initiative than compassionate conservation, there are a lot of issues that kind of might fall under the scope of wild animal welfare that are perhaps a little bit more tangential to um, compassionate conservation. So one example would be um, the incidental capture of marine wildlife in commercial fishing gear, um, lethal poison control. So in the Netherlands, where I spent a lot of time, rodenticides um, are now effectively banned as of July 1st, uh, which is good news. But these kinds of things, um, you know, I think all fall under the scope of, of wild animal welfare and help distinguish it maybe from other fields. Um, and in addition to, as I mentioned earlier, some of the, the ethical concerns raised by um, the way that we do research on other species. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I think I think parts of what I would have said were were already said. Um, so, but I think, and maybe repackaging them a bit or some linkages that I see. Um, Dale, your last point is I think these kind of conversations come out like so 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 when I when I teach and probably when you taught the animal studies classes and you know we'll, we'll talk about everybody there kind of is is pretty much on board with valuing non-human animals as individuals and also understanding that there can be relational duties that are different depending on whether we're talking about so-called livestock animals, which if we just set them all free, we would need to keep stewarding them, um, you know, versus other, and, and I think what we often grapple with is it's really hard to know if we care about their welfare, what would actually be best for them, right? And so I think this, and so getting, getting to the other point is like, so ethology, what I like, wild animal welfare, we have to understand animals themselves. So it's it's like animal ethology. We actually have to understand their subjective experience, what they want, how they behave, so that we can help them. So I feel like what's what's new, it's not this, it's about a different kind of blending of uh, the, the scientific rigor of animal ethology and understanding that that's necessary to be able to help animals, blending that with building on an ethical framework. So it's unlike ethology, which is explicitly about mostly about the science of learning behavior of animals. It's explicitly about valuing animals as individuals and how we can help them. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that, it's, that it's the bringing together of, of, of those two things. Um, and while, at, while in the process of this, what makes it so difficult is understanding that I think maybe like back when, back maybe when you wrote against zoos, it might've been relatively easy to answer what we do with wild animals. As much, much as possible, we, we cordon off the places that are in the native habitat and leave them alone which as Dale already said, we can't do anymore. And so in this broader context of actually having to examine closely non-human animal behavior in the wild to understand what it is they want and need, uh, you know, and then figure out how we can help them, there's this shifting background of how they're responding to constant change uh, that we need to take account of as we do this. So instead of answering my own question. Uh, I, I would rather build on, on what the others have said for a minute. I think Dale in particular made a really important point that can be difficult to acknowledge, which is that there are, especially right now, profound limitations, again, on 
what we know, what we can do, what we are willing to do. And so even well-intentioned efforts can backfire, do more harm than good, or do as much harm than good, especially in these complex systems. And I think one of the most important points to note, and a really important starting point in this entire discussion, is to recognize both the importance and the difficulty of this issue at the same time in equal measure, because that can be really difficult to do at the same time. Once you accept that this is an important issue, once you accept that there are so many wild animals and their welfare matters and our activity is impacting them and you feel the responsibility that comes along with that, you wanna be able to do something. And so then it can be really easy to dismiss the limitations on our knowledge and power and political will. But then likewise, if you really accept and internalize how limited our abilities are right now, how little we know, how little we can do, how little we care to do, how much even well-intentioned activity can backfire. Once you recognize that, it can be really tempting to dismiss the importance of the issue because when you know that something is hard, you would rather not feel like you need to do it. And so I think a really, really important starting point is to really sit with and internalize the idea that this is important and this is difficult and really accept our responsibilities and our limitations in equal measure, and then go from there and really gradually carefully figure out what we can do that might be helpful within our limitations. That's great. I think that's a nice place to end for that question, actually. So um, do you want me to do oh, the sure. for? Yeah, go for it. Um, OK, so the final question before we open up to the audience for discussion is what research questions and policy agendas are brought into focus by wild animal welfare? And for this one, we'll start with Colin. Huh. Um, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I feel, oh, I'm, I feel like in some ways, these are like, these questions are reformulating each other. Um, not that it's exactly the same, but, but I feel like we've, the answers we've given to prior questions um, answered this question. But you can make up your own question. That is, yeah, feel that free to continue, <laughs> choose your own adventure. <laughs> well, I guess I, I've already staked out. I mean, my own, I, I think my own uh, window into this that it opens up is, um, I mean, Dale, you know, this category that if we want to use that Donaldson and Kim look at, you, liminal animals, these non-human animals that are either, quote, non-native in the places where they're living, or they may be native to a territory or country, but are not living in the habitat that they were supposed to be living in, they're living in cities. Uh, and I think that um, I think that this is a huge category of non-human animals that is growing. More and more animals are becoming liminal animals, are becoming pedestrian animals. And, um, and, and, and to the extent that we've, I think we still have this old framework that's like the wild animals out there and we kind of let them be. Uh, and then we've got, we've got the livestock animals and, we've, and then we've got companion animals that we care about. Um, but that thinking about this growing category of, of liminal animals, which isn't just about then protecting them, but I think they really challenge our, our uh, sense of what it means to live with animals. I think for most of us, living with animals means pets. Um, and then occasionally we, we're tourists that get to experience animals in cool ways hope when, we go to, when we go out to more wild places. Uh, and that, you know, I think more and more of us are going to have to, um, that, so looking at this growing category of liminal animals, help, you know, not only hopefully will help animals and make us value them more, but will force us to think about what it means to live with animals in ways that we haven't had to before. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I feel like one of the, central challenges in wild animal welfare as far as I'm concerned. And I'd be curious for other panelists thoughts on this. Um, kind of has to do with how do we measure animal welfare and what are our reference points? So when it comes to conventional animal welfare, um, like if we're often comparing the welfare of animals in captive settings to what we know about how they behave um, in the wild. I mean, even something like abnormal behavior is defined as a behavior that occurs only or more often in captive settings as compared to the wild. So there's a very clear reference point. 
Um, but when it comes to wild animal welfare, like what is our reference point? Are we comparing the welfare of individuals um, in areas with lower human impact to population to areas, um, you know, to populations who live in areas with um, a different level of human impact? Like, are, are those comparisons the useful comparisons? And it also, I couldn't help but thinking on the train here, um, how this relates to like shifting baselines. And so this idea that, you know, um, the kind of degraded environment becomes the norm because over successive generations, people um, don't know anything different and how that actually could also apply to how we understand and measure animal welfare. Um, so, you know, we might take animal welfare today as sort of being in this impoverished or as being, you know, in this, this kind of normal or good state, but in fact, perhaps it's impoverished compared to previous generations. And so how do we know that? What are our reference points? Um, that's something I've been thinking about. So, um, so a moral intuition that a lot of people have that philosophers quite rightly dump on is that our fundamental obligation is to do no harm. And again, the Ten Commandments are basically written that way. This is sort of something that we kind of grow up with, you know, and then a bunch of, you know, uh, overly smart philosophers come along and point out that in fact, there's all kinds of cases when not doing harm and conferring benefits are indistinguishable, and it's sort of irrational to prefer one to another and so on. And so we get to a view where, very quickly, we're sort of contributing to welfare. That, that let's put it this way. If compromising welfare is wrong, then contributing to welfare looks as morally compelling as not compromising welfare. And I think all of that is true philosophically, but it can lead us to overlook some things that are, I think, really important when we are figuring out what to do. And uh, one of these things is that it's often actually quite easier to tell whether you're harming something and damaging something than it is whether you're actually improving its welfare from three to seven, right? So, at, so not at the philosophical level that attracts many people to these questions, but at the, but at the level of what should I do, the, something that people used to call the first law of holes, I think can, can actually get a lot of traction. Namely, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. We're doing an enormous amount to damage wild animals, a huge amount to damage non-human animals. It's not rocket science to identify what some of those things are, and then hard, but to try to take actions to, to prevent that. So from, from my point of view, uh, a, a lot of what would be the most tractable in this area and the most worth thinking about early, early on is not how do we create the peaceable kingdom, but how do we stop making the world worse for the other forms of life with which we share the planet? Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. As a starting point, we can agree we should end factory farming, we should end deforestation, we should end the wildlife trade. We can start there, and then we can ask what else might we be doing, although, although we should be asking those questions and uh, taking initiative in those ways now as well. The way that I think about this in general is that we will not be able to turn the ship around overnight. We will not be able to end all of the industries that are harming humans and other animals, including wild animals, and build up an infrastructure that will allow us to support them in the right kind of way overnight. This is going to be a long, multi-generational effort, but we can be taking action now, and we should be taking action now, because part of what needs to happen is we need to build those resources I mentioned before, the knowledge, the power, and the political will necessary so that our future selves or our successors will be in a better position than we are right now to be able to help wild animals ethically and effectively. So I am interested in taking actions right now that are within our power right now 
that can be positive sum, mutually beneficial for humans and at least some wild animals, and that can contribute to learning more about what they need and building up an infrastructure that can lead to helping them more and uh, building up public support for helping them more. So asking questions like, when we upgrade buildings to be more energy efficient, can we also include bird-friendly glass to reduce collisions with birds that harm humans and birds at the same time? Or when we upgrade transportation systems to be more energy efficient, can we also install overpasses or underpasses or wildlife corridors to again, reduce collisions that are bad for humans and non-humans at the same time? And can we take a one health or one welfare or one rights perspective to global health and environmental issues so that when we think about how to prevent the next pandemic, we can recognize how our exploitation of non-human animals is a, a driver of that and a vector for that. And we can reduce that exploitation, but then also increase forms of uh, veterinary care for and vaccinations for and so on wild animals. These positive sum mutually beneficial interventions that can both help at least some wild animals now, but more important, bring them into the conversation, normalize the idea of including them in the conversation so that we can build momentum and improve our ability to help them better at larger scales in the future. And then Becca. Great. Um, so I uh, just have something to say and compliment to everything else. Um, completely agree with all of this, but for me um, and, and my field, my background in animal behavior, animal welfare, um, the specific sort of research and policy agendas that I'm interested in going forward that are, you know, really highlighted by wild animal welfare um, is how we can use animal behavior and animal welfare science to complement these issues. Um, and so how can we study animals um, at the individual level to tell their stories at a personal level, not at the population level, and also tell it from a subjective place of a healthy and positive relationship? Um, and how does that change the sort of knowledge that we generate and to answer some of these questions about, you know, what would they prefer? How are we going to interface with them in urban settings in a way that's less harmful? Um, and like, what ways uh, do we need to stop digging, you know, stop doing the harms because, you know, what are the things that are really um, harming them the most? And, and so having the study of animals being uh, attuned to those sort of practical questions about the changes that need to be made and getting that information directly from the animals themselves at an individual and subjective level as much as possible through science. Um, but then also the role that that kind of scientific storytelling can play in changing the way that we understand animals uh, writ large and then hopefully then change the sort of motivation and change the way that we see animals and change the way that we uh, bring them into resolution and stop, uh, you know, ignoring them essentially and not seeing that they live around us and they live with us and they're part of, um, you know, that we are part of a multi-species uh, community and that th telling those stories about those individual animals that we live amongst um, uh, to sort of bring that into relief, uh, hopefully to build the momentum and political will to make some of these changes that we know we need to do going forward. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you everybody for listening to uh, our initial answers to some of our questions and to other questions that we came up with on the fly. We now have a half hour for discussion with everyone here and with everyone online. And so as I said before, I would like we would like to alternate back and forth between in-person and online questions, starting with an in-person question or comment. So if anybody has a question. Oh, great, lots of hands here. We'll pass around the mic. And uh, we'll also be getting the questions from the online panel. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this panel. So I, I think one topic that's already been touched on is the ways that traditional conservation law or environmental law differs in its substantive focus from animal welfare law, um, as far as focusing on species rather than um, on individual animals. I'm, I'm curious, maybe an, another way it differs is sort of the, the presumption on, on acting sooner rather than later. Um, and by that, I mean, in the conservation context, let's say with invasive species, agencies in the United States will often say, well, 
we need to act sooner rather than later because it, it makes logical sense in the theory that these species could cause great harm to the environment. And if we let that play out, then the horse will have left the barn and it will be you know, too, too late. So even if we don't have a lot of substantive evidence backing up our concerns, we should act now. And a number of courts have interpreted uh, various conservation statutes also to allow agencies to act prior to uh, actual environmental harm taking place. So I'm just curious about how you all think about um, I mean, whether animal welfare suggests we should hold back more, and if that in turn is in tension with hurting a vast number of individual animals that are uh, implicated by these ecosystems that might be under threat should we uh, fail to act quickly to intervene in certain circumstances. Great, thank you. I'm going to suggest that one or two people answer each question instead of us all answering all of them. Would anybody like to take this one? Well, if no one else will, I, I will say this. So, and I may misread your question, but but actually in environmental law, there, there are resources, as you point out, rightly point out, for taking more aggressive action. So the Endangered Species Act, for example, you, you know, we could declare critical habitat, which we hardly ever do under the Endangered Species Act, for example, before species get to that point. We don't do that because we're afraid that we will lose the entire act if we, if, if we do that. That's been the argument in the, in the environmental community. Um, one thing I'm not in love with, but in the Endangered Species Act in over the last decade or more, there's been the creation of habitat conservation plans, for example, that have allowed jurisdictions to do just what Jeff was talking about, namely create wildlife corridors and so on without having to go through really clumsy processes, right, of, 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 of creating easements. So I think there's a lot more flexibility. I mean, even though it's true that our environmental laws are all sort of written on myth of the museum kinds of presuppositions, there is a lot more flexibility, I think, within the statutes themselves than actually is exercised, in part because the environmental community feel, has felt so much under attack about losing these laws in the first place through amendments of, of the field. So I don't know if that's responsive to your question. Yeah, I, I can just briefly add that I hope that people are willing to take action and then learn from experience. I think that there can sometimes be a temptation to default to a kind of precautionary principle because we know that if we take bold action, then we can risk causing new types of harms, right? But of course, because as everybody has said, we are now in the Anthropocene, a world reshaped by human activity, inaction also risks allowing harms we have already caused to play out, right? So both inaction and action carry risks. And so simply defaulting to inaction in the spirit of caution is not really viable anymore. We really have to carefully consider and weigh the costs and risks and harms of, of both action and inaction. And so I am hope, hopeful that people who care about wild animal welfare will be willing to balance those considerations instead of strictly defaulting to you know, moving fast and breaking things or waiting a hundred years until we know more before we try anything, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, just one small thing I'd add to that question. So I, I, this is too simplistic, but I feel like as regards to like environmental law and acting, invasive, we act fast. One, an animal gets to the point of being endangered, now we swing into action to try to do something. And I think what, what wild animal welfare focuses on by focusing on individual animals, it means that we're not only focusing on animals that have high conservation value, as some might say, right? I mean, there can be animals that are doing extraordinarily well on a population level, but if individually they're dying at a much shorter than expected life expectancy, or um, are otherwise, you know, ingesting battery acids and all kinds of things that this, the perspective we are advocating includes monitoring and caring for improving the welfare of those animals as well, right? Whether or not they have conservation value, whether or not they are abundant or endangered, um, and that at least gives some more room to these, these other categories of non-human animals. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we have an online question here um, from Peter Por Porcino. Uh, in working with wild animal welfare, how, how important it 
is it to avoid the temptation? So this is an interestingly worded question. How important is it to avoid the temptation to turn towards misanthropy? <laughs> and do you have any strategies for doing so? So you, I think we can take it either way is, is the risk of misanthropy and then also how important is it to even try not to feel that way. Yeah, is anybody here not a misanthrope? We can start, <laughs> start with there. I, I can speak to that. I don't, I, I think that, um, I mean, the course that I'm teaching here is called The Arrogant Ape. So um, one could very readily conclude that I am a misanthrope. But I, I feel like one ane um, antidote for me is like, it's not a species wide characteristic. Um, the way that we treat wild animals varies immensely across cultures. And actually, a lot of what we're talking about here um, is not about how humans relate to wild animals, but how uh, the dominant culture and economy treats and relates to wild animals. Um, so that is, uh, and, and there are many human cultures around the world, past and present, uh, to whom we can turn for, for guidance, um, including many indigenous societies and traditions. And so um, at the very least, you know, that kind of cultural variation um, gives me solace when I think about misanthropy. I think it's much more about a culture of human exceptionalism than some kind of, um, Kind of you know belief or um, relationship that's intrinsic to our biological makeup as human beings um so maybe misanthrope is not the right word but we could come up with something else and then i totally endorse it <laughs> anybody else yeah just to add briefly i think what we need is humility and a sense of responsibility and accountability and sometimes that can be confused with misanthropy. <laughs> I have I have sometimes been accused of misanthropy because I've noted that sometimes the stakes in a given situation can be higher for other animals than for humans. And sometimes we might need to prioritize the needs of other animals over the needs of humans. But hopefully, of course, we can find positive sum, again, mutually beneficial solutions to our problems. And of course, we need to take care of ourselves in part because we matter to it in part so that we can have what we need to take care of others sustainably and so on and so forth. But the very thought that things matter for them too and the stakes can be high for them too, sometimes is accused of itself being a misanthropic thought. And I wanna push back against that. I think what that is, is an expression of humility and an expression of our responsibility to be good stewards of the planet for all of its uh, uh, residents. Uh, so so I, do, I do think that we need to rethink our place in nature but I think that we can do that in a like loving and generous way towards our own species. And let's uh, hear another question from the in-person crowd. Uh, how about right there? Hi, my name is Philip. Um, thank you for this great event and congratulations on the launch of the program. It's really wonderful. Um, my question, given that it's intrinsically um, exploitative and extractive how and and hegemonic how you're considering if uh the impacts of capitalism in your calculus um perhaps from a multidisciplinary approach with economists sociologists political scientists thanks thank you anyone want to take on capitalism um i'll i'll oh no, no, I was just going to say, I think our sociologist. Uh, I know I was going to say, but he's shaking his head. So um, I, I mean, I, I think the way that I think about it is, um, you know, again, just coming back to the relationship and trying to um, escape the, the logic of competition, the logic of zero sum, and uh, understand that, that that's real that happens there are cases and there's many of them but there's also instances where that sort of capitalistic competitive logic is not at play and there's opportunities like jeff was saying for sort of like mutualistic uh, beneficial relationships reciprocal relationships cooperative relationships um and i guess it kind of goes back to the other question the other question as well we're like you know i think seeing ourselves as pure poison um, and the only solution is to just get ourselves out of there again with this sort of like e either or thinking um, is actually, I think, in the long term harmful to wild animals because um, we're, we're part of nature. We're here. 
we need to learn how to start coordinating and pulling together and seeing things more mutualistically. And, and, and even, even while we're stuck in these uh, capitalistic structures, which again, we could turn to our sociologists to talk about, um, but I, you know, in terms of like the way we think about the relationship um, and then try to, to change that at the core and then uh, build up from there um, to the larger structural uh, issues that are going on um, as well. Um, yeah. so everybody's looking at me to say, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's, I think to be frank, the wild, uh, the, the wild animal welfare program is not going to overthrow capitalism. Um, <gasps> so I think our, our, our aims are, are more modest, but to take your question seriously, um, I think that there's definitely, there's definitely not only room for that, but that I think some, some folks, uh, that are a part of this group, maybe not in this room today, but some people in this room today have taken up some pieces of that as we can, um, really demonstrate them empirically and in ways that we think can be laser focused on changing some policy. So for instance, um, Jennifer Jacquet has done research looking at the intentional mislabeling of fit aquatic you know, fish that are, that are caught so that they can be um, sold you know, when actually it should be illegal and emphasizing how in the particular economic system that we have and with the particular way that policies and labeling are set up, it's all too easy for this to be gamed and so i think those are the kinds of ways that i anticipate us um inter intervening in those kinds of larger issues is is to the extent that we're you know we can do a particular investigation that will allow us to demonstrate how uh there are particular economic and political incentives or or gaps that allow particular actions to occur certainly and i would just say i do think more widely we carry that I, as a sociologist carry that spirit of understanding that these social categories of animals that we've constructed, whether they're wild or livestock or pests, um, have have been developed in part and parcel with our economic system and that are useful for it. And so I think that's it's definitely a part of the conversation. Great. So we'll turn to another question from the online audience. Um, and so um, the, the question is written, how, how do we help some non-human animals without causing harm to others, predation, resource competition? And I'm just going to unpack that a little bit, if I may. So I think one of the, the issues here is that um, when you help, and we've talked about this a bit, but if we can talk about it a little bit more, how, how can we sort of think about um, you know, unintended consequences, basically? So that, and, and you know, as Dale pointed out, like, oh, the animals thinking, oh dear, here comes a homo sapien to help. Um, and, and what are some maybe things that we can think about as the biggest flags that we should be concerned about, um, biggest things to keep track of, and any sort of mitigating uh, uh, actions that we could take potentially to um, keep our eye on unintended consequences, second order consequences of the, the, the way we think about wild animal welfare. The big one. Any idea? Well, I, I certainly don't have an answer to the question, except to say, in a way, this goes back to Jeff's humility point, is, you know, we are animals who are subject to laws of nature, and any intervention that we make in nature is itself subject to the laws of nature, and one of those laws of nature is natural selection. And the reason there are predators in the world is because there are, there are niches for predators to evolve. And um, nothing other than creating another freeze frame on the world of the sort that we think isn't even a successful conceptual model is going to repeal any of the laws of nature, including that one. So it is going to be uh, one of the background facts, I think, that always has to be observed and, and taken into account. And frankly, I think one of the contributions this project can make is I think that some of the discussion of these of these issues, particularly in the part of philosophers, have tended has tended to be rather airy and sort of removed from the actual empirical facts uh, of the planet on which we find ourselves and the biological systems in which we are all embedded. And I would like to add to that um, as well. So, just um, in terms of the kind of research that I do, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be formalized through research, but when we extract ourselves from these incredibly complex systems that are ecosystems, it's 
incredibly difficult to have any kind of sense about what is going to happen when you pull on one string and, and is that gonna cause a cascade? And to some degree, you know, just as Jeff said, being humble and going in a little bit more to learn from the systems before we start making decisions about what to do with them. So spending time to understand them better. And I'm not saying that this is an answer, but it, I believe at least could be better than, uh, you know, from this airy position outside, um, you know, extracted, not embedded. Uh, I think it's more likely that something that looks like a good idea from that perspective is going to go horribly wrong uh, rather than, uh, you know, coming from a place of learning and, and just observing to begin with uh, before jumping into making decisions about things to be done. So just basically a, it's a call for, for um, more information and, and reconnecting. Or at least before doing big scale irreversible. <laughs> and before, and, and uh, that is of course, after we have stopped factory farming, right, right. stopped the wildlife tribes on the things that we know are actually just actually horrible. So I, I do want to point to an analogy here. So in the, in the climate change discussion now, because we're being so bad at actually stopping the insults to the atmosphere through our emissions, there's a lot of interest these days in geoengineering. Mm -hmm. Essentially, let's just figure out how to, how to turn some knobs and fix the system. And if we're going to, if we are going to intervene in the climate system, then, um, well, what was so great about the Holocene, right? I mean, I, I mean, you know, let's let's find a better spot in the thermostat. Let's find the optimal spot in the thermostat. Now, I think probably even most people in this room find something somewhat repellent about that view, but there is a danger of this kind of discussion about wild animal welfare moving very much in the same in, in, in the same direction. Let's do the equivalent of geoengineering nature so that it doesn't have all the horrible stuff going on that we, don't, that we don't like very much. So, you know, so again, you know, everything exists in a system and intervening in nature in one place is connected to intervening in, in, in nature in other places, including the human mentality that one brings to it. I am more open than Dale is to doing that. No, but, um, uh, can I build on both of all of these comments, actually, just with a couple of quick specific examples? Um, because I think, you know, what Becca was saying earlier about the importance of um, going into this with an open mind and trying to learn from other species, these, you know, large scale solar geoengineering initiatives, um, to my knowledge, like haven't totally yet engaged seriously with what dimming the sun, what kind of effect that would have on pollinator species, um, like, you know, birds and bees who rely on the precise orientation of the sun to navigate to food sources. And so it's just an example of how understanding a little bit more about these animals and their behaviors and seeing them as, you know, these sort of animate um, complex beings can help us to, um, you know, tread a little bit more carefully when it comes to these huge initiatives. And then back to the um, kind of example, um, we were talking about earlier, I just, I wanted to mention, you know, with these like evolutionary trade-offs and um, conversations about potentially eradicating predation, or at least trying to, you know, minimize the suffering that's due to these predator-prey relationships. Um, an instance of kind of where careful attention to an understanding of other animals' complex social worlds might lead one to um, take into account the fact that, for instance, when large carnivore species like lions are, are hunting for prey, actually the coordination of their hunt is a fundamental way in which they solidify social relationships and social bonds. So to try to connect back to what I was saying earlier about the importance of kind of understanding sociality um, and, and the ways in which, you know, some of these kind of decisions that could potentially be made would have trade-offs for how, um, predators, for instance, establish and maintain relationships and, and derive meaning in their own lives. Okay, great. We have about 10 minutes left and lots of questions still, <laughs> the vast majority of which we will not get to. Let's go for something in the back. Let's go all the way back back there uh, so as to not be frontist uh, in our, <laughs> our Q&A. And then we promise to keep our answers to two or so people each. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian. Thanks so much. This is a really great talk. Appreciate being here. 
I guess I have a follow-up question about the humility topic, which is how comfortable are you pushing that humility? So for example, how confident are you that deforestation is bad for wild animals? Or how confident are you that climate change is bad? One of the things that you mentioned is an intervention around you know, birds and crashing into buildings. If I saw that happen, if that was you know, ameliorated, I don't know how happy I'd be because I need to know as a result of that, are the, how are the birds interacting now that they're alive and well with all the other individuals? And so it makes me uncomfortable because I wanna help but I also feel like every time I encounter any enthusiasm around any intervention or any sadness over something happening, the first thought I have is, I don't know if that's right. And I'd like to know if that makes sense and your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I can uh, briefly address it and then see if anybody else wants to. I actually totally agree with you. And, and a big point that I emphasized in my book, which spent a lot of time on, on this question, is again about the tension here between recognizing this is important and we need to take action, and this is complex, and there can be all kinds of trade-offs and unintended side effects. And once we include wild animals in our moral circle and we realize how vast and diverse the world of interests and needs are, with wild animals in the moral circle, we realize that really everything will involve trade-offs, right? We traditionally think climate change is clearly bad because we traditionally think only of humans. And yeah, there will be mixed effects for humans, but it will be, you know, a lot, a lot more bad than than good for humans. But once you consider wild animals, you have to consider the fact that, well, climate change is going to make things warmer in the north and in the south and allow certain insect and parasite populations to move north and south. And you have to ask how many more of those lives are gonna be possible in a warmer world? And are those lives good lives for their subjects or bad lives for their subjects? Jellyfishes will thrive in oceans <laughs> reshaped by climate change. So you do have to take that seriously. And it does raise these new questions about whether the things that we have conventionally taken to be good and bad, we can still clearly take to be good and bad. Now, with all of that said, I do still think that all things considered, even from that dizzying perspective, we can still take factory farming, deforestation, the wildlife trade, and human-caused climate change to be bad, not only because they are bad for many human and non-human animals at present, both directly and indirectly, but also because they are threat multipliers that destabilize things, make other problems worse, and are going to uh, create more problems or intensify more problems beyond them. Uh, over time. And so if, if what we really care about is doing more good in the long run, then we should not only care about their kind of direct or nearby indirect effects, but also the generally destabilizing longer term effects they can have and, and regard them as bad for that reason. I, I want to push the humility point even further. It's, it, it's not just that we don't know enough about the world, it's that we don't know enough about ourselves. And we are these, and I think your question was a wonderful question because we are these incredibly complex, emotional, rational systems, blah, 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 that we, can't, that we really can't disentangle these things. And so when we go out and look at the world and try to figure out what the balance is between A, B, and C, all of this is through this incredibly complex, emotive, cognitive lens that we ourselves have. And one thing that we should recognize about that, I think, I mean, take predator-prey relations. It's very easy to watch a nature documentary in which you are identifying with the prey animal, you know, scurrying around trying to escape, you know, the, vicious, the teeth of the vicious lion and so on and so forth. And oh my God, it's like moving to the, you know, the home team to root for the prey. It's also very easy in the next flip the channel and you're identifying with the predator, the starving predator who just wants to feed her children and so on and so forth. Now, the fact that our emotional responses are so malleable and so contextually sensitive. I think should make us humble, not just about what we know about the world, but in terms of the transparency of our own ability to actually do the sums in the first place. Doesn't mean that we don't have to act. We do have to act and we do have to, have to judge, but the humility shouldn't, so to speak, begin at the edge of our skin. It should actually begin with our own hearts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll take a question from online. Um, a practical question here for those of us who work from Casey Bond, for those of us who work in animal advocacy, how do we begin to prioritize the many different issues impacting wild animals in terms of our research and campaigns? 
Um, she says she'd know how she'd do it hypothetically from an effective altruism standpoint, but she's interested in hearing other perspectives as well. So do we have any sort of um, animal advocacy uh, ideas or research areas? I mean, I can just briefly reiterate what, what I said before, which is that I think right now we are in a place where we are considering these changes to our buildings and our transportation systems and so on and so forth. And I think that we can get a lot of public support behind the idea of adding these features to them, things like bird-friendly glass, things like wildlife corridors, because everybody recognizes that these are good for humans and non-humans at the same time, and because it normalizes the idea of including wild animals in their welfare in these conversations. So I think that is one area that can be good from a campaigning perspective for advocates. I also think that there are a lot of other areas where we could be exploring right now, things like uh, vaccinations for wild animals that can have health benefits for humans and other animals at the same time, uh, reducing the unnecessary pain and suffering caused by pesticides uh, and other forms of wildlife control, stopping blaming and killing wild animals as a first resort uh, whenever we perceive conflicts between human and non-human needs, calling them invasives and uh, taking militaristic approaches to, to conflict resolution. I think those are some low hanging fruit opportunities that can right now have public support. They might not be the most important issues at scale, but they can be ways to build momentum so that we can later have what we need to address the more important issues at scale. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could add that when it comes to animal advocacy issues um, and efforts, going back to this point about these complex, these irreducibly complex interconnected systems in which we live, in which, you know, our um, efforts on one level could affect um, the well-being of animals on so many other levels. I think that also can sort of be reassuring in the context of advocacy that kind of taking a small chunk, biting off a small chunk of this irreducibly complex puzzle can actually have ripple effects um, to ecosystems at large. And also just within the human species, right? That we tend to emphasize the kind of importance of, of collective action and systemic change, which is no doubt important. But because we live in these kind of complex societies in these interconnected systems, people like, Greta, for instance, have taught us that, you know, the impact, the sort of choices and the, the voice and the advocacy efforts of one individual can actually um, spread out and affect entire societies. And so that can be really encouraging from an advocacy standpoint that can be incredibly, um, what, what do they call them, recovering environmentalists and can lead to a lot of sort of recovering environmentalists because there's just too much out there. Great, thank you. And I'll just quickly add on to that too, that um, I think one thing that can be done in the advocacy world is just to sort of connect the dots a little bit more and see how there's interrelationships as Christine is talking about. And, um, you know, but also that, you know, if you care about, uh, you know, if you care about farming, if you care about, you know, animals and agriculture, you know, that has implications for wild animals as well. These are, you know, interconnected issues. It's interconnected with environmental protection as well. And so I think starting to build up a community and network and sort of you could almost play like this circular thing of where do you enter in this network about what you care about and then how do you end up also reaching all of these other issues that are interrelated and 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 just putting wild animal welfare in that map yeah and by the way if anybody ever tries to use wild animal welfare as a reason not to end factory farming <laughs> and animal agriculture because oh plant farming harms wild animals yes it does and we should care about that but animal agriculture uses more land and requires more plant farming and therefore more wild animal deaths in plant farming than plant-based agriculture <laughs> does. So, so please push back against that argument when you encounter that. In any case, we are uh, out of time. So, so I, I would like to close by, by noting a few things before those of us who are here in person all go eat and drink a bunch of good vegan food and drink. So first of all, I want to thank our fellow panelists. Uh, really, really appreciate your being affiliates on this program and also appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for that. I want to thank, yes. And I want to thank everybody here for being here. I don't know if people online can see that this room is packed 
right now uh, at the very busy beginning of the semester with people from NYU, but then also people from at least a half dozen, if not more, other universities, from nonprofit organizations who are working on these issues. So already building a community where we can be working to build this field, which is really exciting. So thank you all for being here. And I want to note for everybody here and online that this is the launch event, but we are now going to get rolling and we are going to be embarking on research projects and we are also going to be doing more events like this one. So you can go to our website, you can find it on Google, NYU Wild Animal Welfare Program and sign up for our email list to find further events that will be happening this semester and later on. We are also right now announcing that we are sponsoring this year an early career award and workshop for wild animal welfare. So PhD students or early career academics can submit papers to our website and then we will look at them all and some papers will be selected to receive a cash award and then be flown to NYU to speak at the NYU workshop on wild animal welfare, which will take place in fall 2023. So please take a look at that if it might apply to you and uh, spread the word about it if it might apply to others. And finally, again, there is vegan food and vegan drinks outside. So let's all go hang out and talk about this some more for those of you who are here in person and everybody in person online. Again, thank you for being here with us. We really appreciate it.